Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have another very special episode in the Toxic series. Today's episode involves magnetized solvent. And so originally there was an expression of concern from green chemistry in July 2020, and it wasn't finally retracted until 2022. So the, the publisher tried reaching out to the authors for correspondence, but they didn't respond, and so that's kind of unfortunate. It's a little bit surprising how long it took to get retracted, given how blatantly unreal this chemistry is, and you're going to see why pretty shortly. So we're going to read through parts of this, we're going to gloss over some other parts, but we'll just start with the title. Metal-free green synthesis of aryl amines in magnetized distilled water, experimental aspects and molecular dynamics simulation. Now we're not going to talk too much about computational chemistry in this one because that's not my area of expertise. If you notice anything from the computational part that you think is worth mentioning, make sure you discuss it down in the comment section. I'd be very interested to hear what you have to say about that. Um, what I do want to say ahead of time is I want to give a shout out to Tambochem from the Discord for bringing this paper to my attention, as well as M Fernflower for discussions about this article. If you want to involve yourself in the discussions moving forward, I'd encourage you to join the Discord where we talk about a lot of these really terrible papers before I ultimately decide on what I'm going to make a video about. Okay. In this work, a simple green and transition metal free approach to the N aerylation of secondary amines with aryl halides in magnetized distilled water, MDW. They're going to use this throughout the paper, so just make sure you remember MDW stands for magnetized distilled water, as a solvent is introduced. This method offers advantages of short reaction times, low costs, and an additive free process, and it also enables new planning strategies for the construction of aryl amine containing pharmacophores. We're just going to skip down here a bit. The analysis that they do revealed that morpholine and iodobenzene were surrounded by more solvents in MDW, magnetized distilled water, than ordinary distilled water. Consequently, the high reactivity observed for the two reactants in MDW at 90 degrees C can be explained by MD simulation, and there comes an established synergy between the theoretical calculation and experiment. Okay. So they give about uh, they give a decent introduction, better than most of the BS papers that we talk about on this channel. They give like a decent enough introduction talking about SNAR chemistry, some of the challenges associated with it, and then they start talking about transition metalized uh, transition metal catalyzed reactions to afford N aerylated amines. Although these reaction protocols are given with comprehensive applications, there are still some respective limitations, like the cost, like the use of costly ligands, costly ligands. They just told us twice. Sometimes, you know, yeah, you do need two ligands for a reaction occasionally. And toxic transition metals and severe reaction conditions that may cause the potential contamination of products, limiting their application, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, as far as I know, Buckwald Hartwig amination, which is a CN bond forming reaction utilizing palladium as a transition metal, is widely, widely used in medicinal chemistry. So while, yes, there's issues with the toxicity of palladium, uh, medicinal chemistry people have very reliable ways to get rid of this. Yes, they might prefer to have chemistry that works without palladium, but this is the state of the art. I uh, predict at some point in time that Hartwig will actually win a Nobel Prize for this work because it's so important in medicinal chemistry. It's such a common reaction at this point. Okay. In this perspective, the transition metal-free amination of aryl halides provides a promising alternative route for the preparation of aryl amines. Since they are potentially less expensive, avoid the requirement to use designer ligands. I've, uh, I appreciate this phrase, designer ligands. Uh, it's, you know, I think most ligands have to be designed unless you just so happen to find something from nature that works. But even then, you know, you're usually looking for stuff that resembles existing ligands that you use. And so what you'd consider a designer ligand, it's pretty ambiguous and remove trace metal impurities. So what I don't know about this chemistry is how the chemistry itself removes trace metal impurities. You might say that the utilization of a transition metal free process removes the need to remove trace metal impurities. However, the chemistry itself won't remove trace metal impurities unless you already have trace metal impurities that somehow get removed in the purification. Now in their chemistry, they do chromatography. And if you want to do chromatography you know, in an actual scenario, that's going to be the most expensive part of the process. So we could definitely look at this initially thing, uh, this original thing and say low costs is definitely not the case, even if this chemistry worked because they do chromatography later. Okay. Uh, they summarized that in 2009 that this author reported the metal free reaction of aryl halides with amines in the presence of potassium HMDS. Now, potassium was a metal the last time I checked. Now, if they were talking about transition metals, that's different. They talk about transition metals several other times. In this case, they don't give us that clarity. 
Okay, let's continue. A lot of these protocols, however, have some drawbacks, like the use of a strong base, potassium HMDS, and Buley terputoxide. I also kind of want to highlight here that they use HMDS, but earlier they give the actual like formula, hexamethyl disilazide. Now, normally if you're writing a paper, you should actually have consistent language throughout, and that's an important thing to recognize. So if this was a good published article, you'd want to have the same uh, terminology used throughout rather than varying it. And butylithium, terputoxide as on a inert atmosphere, organic bases, harmful organic solvents, and expensive reagents, and have a long reaction time. So one of the things that they do in this paper is they actually end up finding that a longer reaction time works better in their reported reaction. Now, I'm not claiming that this chemistry works. I firmly believe that this chemistry does not work based on my understanding of organic chemistry. However, some of these SNAR reactions that they report on really electron deficient substrates might work just due to the nature of the substrate. Now, they also talk about organic bases, which we're going to come back to later. So it's important. Remember organic bases. Okay, in order to overcome these problems, the development of a more suitable, milder, cheaper, and efficient method, as well as environmentally benign one, is desirable for the synthesis of aryl amines. That's true. We always want to develop milder and more eco-friendly chemistry, but oftentimes it's easier said than done. The water magnetization technique is an easy one without extra energy consumption when a permanent external magnet is utilized. Such a magnet can be installed on a previously established water tube system, resulting in no additional energy requirement for water magnetization. This technology is clean and has zero energy consumption. Okay, so if the magnet is doing anything to the water, absolutely energy is being used, right? You can't have something interact with a magnetic field without some energy transfer you know, occurring, because otherwise there's no interaction, right? If there's an interaction, that by definition means that there's a transfer of energy. So this is a little bit silly. Um, they also say that pure water as a polar and associative ligand can modify intermolecular bonds in an applied magnetic field, changing it to a metastable state and keeping that state for some time. So if you do low temperature NMR, you can actually see this effect. So variable temperature NMR can often show the that uh, a magnetic field can have an effect on molecules to some extent. Now, what that effect is, is, um, you know, debatable. Is it the temperature that's playing more of a role and you're just studying it with a magnetic field? That would be my understanding, is that the magnetic field itself isn't causing any change in the chemistry. Rather, it's looking at properties of the nucleus, right? We're looking at electrons most of the time when we do chemistry, not at the nucleus. Okay, so they, they do molecular dynamics simulations. I've just included this here if you're not familiar with molecular dynamics, and they say, in recent years, the influence of magnetized water on structural properties of reactants and consequently on the reaction yields has theoretically and experimentally shown in ambient conditions. I don't know what it's shown, but they say it's experimentally shown. Okay, so the results. Magnetized solvents slash distilled water were prepared using a static magnetic system of 0.8 tesla field strength at different magnetic field time exposures. The solvent slash distilled water was put in a test tube, which was then placed in the magnetic field for 20 minutes. So they fill up a test tube with water and they just stick it between a couple magnets. That's it. The tube was subsequently removed from the instrument, the magnets, and used for the reaction. So, uh, I'm, there's one really obvious thing here, and I'm going to tease you guys and not tell you yet, but there's a huge issue with this whole experiment that we're going to mention. Uh, I think I'll get to it in a bit. So they uh, did this chemistry. They tested solvents such as xylene, toluene, benzene, chloroform, DCM, THF, dioxane, acetonitrile, DMF, methanol, ethanol, and water in the presence of potassium carbonate. Okay, so the title was metal free. Here they say they tested the chemistry with potassium carbonate. That's potassium. There's a metal. Although that their final conditions that they report don't use potassium carbonate, they still use potassium carbonate. And additionally, since they're motivated to exclude solvents that might be organic solvents that are toxic, they still screen them all. So clearly that's not what they're motivated by. It is noteworthy that the aerolation of morpholine could not be achieved even after the reaction time was prolonged to six hours. Okay. Here they tell us that it seems that um, the uh, magnetized deionized water is a suitable solvent with respect to the yield for 3A. Therefore, we attempted to optimize the reaction conditions using magnetized deionized or distilled water in order to improve the yield of the target product 3A. And so here they show you what their setup is, and it's literally just sticking a test tube between two magnets. But like, if they were really doing this, why didn't they just like take a picture of what they were doing, right? And they didn't include a picture in their SI either. This is just some like really low resolution thing. And what's that instrument? What What is that? Like, 
if it's just a test tube of water between two magnets, what's that thing? What's it for? Do they need to stir it? But the magnetic field should be going throughout. Why do they need to stir it? Okay. So uh, here they show us an optimization table. They even managed to have like a bond length issue where uh, they didn't clean up their structure, but you know, it is what it is. Here they magnetized all these different solvents, which means they put it in a test tube and put it between a couple magnets. And uh, then they just tested this chemistry at 50 degrees. Apparently, the reaction temperature played an important role in achieving a high yield. That's surprising, you know, <laughs> obviously. Okay, an increase in the reaction temperature of up to 90 degrees Celsius led to a high reaction yield. We heated it up more and the reaction went further. That's a fairly standard thing in chemistry. They uh, screened some other bases. My favorite one here is cesium-2 oxygen-3, which I guess would be dicesium ozonide, but that's not even your typical ozonide, so that's kind of a unique one. Uh, probably just a typo, but who's to say? And then they screen some other bases. So here they have potassium carbonate, KOH, etc., etc., except uh, they say that they screened cesium ozonide, but that's not listed in their table here. Oh, actually it is. <laughs> so they, uh, they allegedly did use cesium ozonide. Uh, wow, that's a, that's a special one there. Okay, and then they screen some other bases as additives. Triethylamine, diisopropylethylamine, pyridine. However, they screen pyrrolidine, and they still claim that this reaction, shown here, works with pyrrolidine uh, in the presence of the morpholine. So pyrrolidine is actually a secondary amine. It's actually nucleophilic. It's more nucleophilic than morpholine. So it's a little bit surprising that they report the yield of the morpholine adduct, but they don't report the yield of the pyrrolidine adduct since they're using an equivalent amount of pyrrolidine based on their conditions here. So this is like another red flag that this is a BS paper right here. Um, additionally, they say that they do this base free. However, they can't be doing this base free because they have morpholine. Okay, so that's concerning as well. Now, uh, they don't tell us how much water they use here. They tell us that there's like an iodobenzene, there's morpholine and there's a base, but there's no water. Okay, like what concentration is this run at? That's kind of important, don't you think? I would think so. Uh, here, they also don't show any uh, solvent. However, up here, they tell us that they use five mils of the solvent. Okay, so let's go up a little bit more. They said it's base-free. We know it's not base-free. Additionally, they say at the beginning of the reaction, the pH of the aqueous solution was 10.9. It's slightly basic because they have a base in there. And at the end of the reaction, the pH was decreased to 10.5. Okay, if we're assuming that the yields are as high as they report, because they're using one equivalent of their iodobenzene and one equivalent of their amine, they uh, should be getting full conversion to their tertiary amine product. And this should uh, form hydrogen iodide as a byproduct. So if all of the product is protonated, every last molecule of product is protonated, all of it's in its protonated base form. This shouldn't have a pKa of 10.5. It should be slightly acidic because there's no base in solution at all. There's zero base, right? All of the base is protonated in its acid form. So if anything, this the pH of the resulting solution should be lower than 7. So this is another red flag that this is BS. There can't be any other impurities in the water doing stuff because it was distilled, so this should have a pH of 7 when it started. So that's like another massive, massive red flag. Okay. It seems that the use of potassium carbonate not only shortens uh, only shortens the reaction time and does not have any effect on the reaction yield. Thus, the optimized reaction conditions for this n aerylation reaction were the use of uh, the magnetized distilled water at 90 degrees without any base, except we know that they have a base. As expected, the desired product could be obtained in with 94% yield in four hours. A number of researchers have reported that when applied magnetic field is removed from the magnetized distilled water, its magnetization does, effect does not disappear immediately and can be maintained for a relatively long period of time. Relatively is ambiguous, okay? This phenomenon is called the memory effect. It was found that magnetized water kept its magnetization property for up to three hours. It, it doesn't tell us what this magnetization property is, and they don't tell us how they measure it other than saying that they tested their water after various amounts of time. A reaction performed in water magnetized for some time, how, how much time? There's just some, uh, was as acceptable as that carried out in a freshly magnetized water with a high reaction yield. Okay, so I'm going to level with you guys here. You've been listening to the video this long. How do we stir our reactions? Sometimes we do them mechanically, but nine, maybe 19 times out of 20, how do we do it? We do it with a magnetic stir bar, a permanent magnet. And uh, what do we stir them on? A magnetic stir plate. 
So there's always a magnetic field for all of our reactions. Yeah, and even if we're heating, there's still usually a permanent magnet underneath, so the solvent would always be magnetized. Yeah, so uh, just chew on that one for a minute. I'm just going to give you like another 10 seconds or so to digest that. Every reaction we do is magnetized. Basically, more or less, unless you're heating something on a steam bath, but usually, you know, it's still on a hot plate. In that hot plate, it's usually it's a stir plate as well, so there's still a permanent magnet. So this whole thing is just complete garbage, complete baloney. Okay, so let's go a little bit more forward here. Here they uh, they screen a bunch of different nucleophiles and then they show the the product formed. Here they recognize that pyrrolidine is a nucleophile that can react, okay? So yes, now pyrrolidine can react and form adducts, but before it was only a base. If they're only using it as a base, I guess they can't use it as a nucleophile, but unfortunately chemistry doesn't work that way. If you put in a chemical, it's gonna do whatever it wants and you're just gonna hope that you want what it does. Okay. They also have this really terrible formatting, and I don't know how this got through review either. Like, like they, can, they couldn't even figure out how to put brackets around the references, but whatever, we'll just put a pin in that. Okay, so they say that uh, this, this occurs without any difficulty. If it was without any difficulty, they wouldn't need to heat it, they wouldn't need to wait, they wouldn't need to magnetize their solvent. So I think it's a little bit much to say without any difficulty. Okay, so they, uh, the scope of aryl chlorides was investigated. They also talk about using bromides. They basically say what you would expect them to say. Iodides worked best. Bromides work okay. However, chloride still worked a little bit. Here you can see that kind of summarized in the table here. But even still, like the chloride yields that they report are insanely high. Like for a catalyst-free transformation with one equivalent of each, it's absolutely unbelievable, especially using water as a solvent. Even if it wasn't with this weird magnetized stuff, it would be an incredible yield for any... C and bond forming reaction. Even if it was like an alkylation of an amine, this would be impressive, okay? Okay, so they, uh, we also tried to enhance the reaction was tested with aniline substrates and a variety of heterocycles. So they, they further go on and they, they try and make even bolder claims, claiming that they can start coupling heterocycles to the benzene ring, which normally if you wanted to do this type of chemistry, you need to use some sort of copper catalyst or some other transition metal. And even then it's still like very useful and the yields are not this high. And so they're claiming to be able to form like pyrazole bound benzenes and indole bound benzenes and imidazole bound benzenes. And uh, they don't give us the right name for the nucleophiles either. And they, they figure out that you can say aniline for the nucleophile, but instead of saying imidazole, they're saying that it's imidazole one ill. And so they, they haven't told us the actual name of the nucleophile. Nonetheless, they, uh, they give us these examples. They also then uh, prepare uh, a table here where they compare the use of different catalysts to their conditions. And you can see that like it's fairly difficult to get these types of couplings to work. Um, and uh, they just say that they can do it without any catalyst at 90 degrees. Don't you think that all of those other papers would have tested that? And, you know, when they were making them, they probably had a magnetic stir bar as well. So, you know, they should have already got higher yields regardless if this chemistry is true. Most of the listed methodologies suffer from some limitations, such as use of catalysts, long reaction times, harsh re reactions, and use of organic solvents. Now, I don't know why they're harsh reactions. They're doing the same reaction, right? What makes it harsh? So they also try and say that they do UV vis on these things, and they can see that product forms based on um, the uh, formation of this product here. You can see that there's like a new big blob. However, the kind of dumb thing is they didn't standardize their results, right? So they have the relative absorption. They don't tell us that they prepared stuff accordingly. They say that they just take like a small amount of it and then they put it into methanol. They don't say how much. So this isn't standardized. You can't calculate conversions with these because they don't do it um, properly the way you do it analytically. So I'm just going to gloss over this. Um, here they say that the solubility of the organic molecules changes whether or not the solvent has been exposed to a magnet, which is a little bit ridiculous in my opinion. If you think that the, the presence of a very slight magnetic field that you've removed from your uh, reaction can somehow affect the solubility, I'd be interested in knowing down in the comments. They tell us that more intense peaks are observed in um, ordinary distilled water rather than magnetized one, which is apparently due to less solubility of reactants in in like uh, just normal distilled water. These results can shed light on more interactions and consequently more reactivity between BI and morpholine reactants in magnetized distilled water at high temperature. Okay, so there, we're just about done here. Thanks for staying if you're still listening at this point. It would, really, it would also really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed, but I'm gonna just talk a little bit longer. 
This technique can be observed as a green replacement for dipolar aprotic solvents like DMF, which is one of the various commonly used solvents for such bond constructions. Moreover, the promising points for the presented presented methodology and its efficiency, generality, easy workup, high to excellent yields, and no need for any additives, making it a useful and attractive process for the synthesis of aryl amines. And then they randomly only give us uh, data for some of their substrates, um, but they do tell us that the reaction progress and purity of the compounds were monitored by TLC analytical silica gel plates. So I don't know why they were analyzing the purity of their compounds as the reaction occurs. Normally, I just would look at reaction progress, and maybe after I do a column, I would use TLC. But they just tell us uh, the reaction progress and purity was monitored. So they they somehow monitored the progress as this was going on. So then they just give us some um, some data for some of their substrates. They get um, analytical data for some of them, and they also do uh, part of their workup. They distill it there. They dilute it with water. So there's already water in there, and they add more water. Why do you need to add more water? right? If it's soluble in organics, it'll be soluble in organics afterwards. Um, okay, so that's like a little bit concerning. Now, the other weird thing is, you remember that we're making a tertiary amine here, right? And uh, because they don't use any base, they're going to be protonated. So you have protonated amines as our product. Those are going to be fairly water soluble. Okay, so what do they do? They dissolve it in water and they, they extract with DCM. They still have their base protonated, they still have their base fully protonated. They can't extract with DCM unless they've done some sort of basic workup to deprotonate the salt, like a wash with potassium carbonate or something. But they don't do that. So they shouldn't even be extracting product. This is just like so many issues. Okay, so that's that's basically the paper. They, uh, they use some other interesting language. Uh, and basically the issue is they, they say that this provides perfect results when they do analysis. And if we just quickly look at their uh, supplemental information, we can see some beautiful Figaro level spectra. If you've enjoyed this video and you enjoy the toxic series, as I said before, it would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed. It would be a lot of fun if more of you joined the Discord because we have a lot of really interesting discussions and it's a really fun time. And I hope you have a great day.